Welcome to Ordinary People with Extraordinary Lives, a podcast dedicated to the testimonies of believers and followers of Jesus Christ. I am your host, Arlene Spucklow. Good morning, friends. Welcome to another episode of Ordinary People with Extraordinary Lives. I am your host, Arlene. Thank you so much, guys, for joining me on another episode. If you are new, welcome to our podcast. I hope that this can be a blessing to you guys, uh, wherever you're listening from or if you're watching on our YouTube channel. Uh, we would love to stay in touch with you guys. Um, you can do that by going on the link here in the description. Uh, you can find the links to go to our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. If you're just listening from one of the podcast platform and you would like to watch the videos because uh, our podcast also includes videos, you can do that by uh, going to our YouTube channel and it's available here on the description. Uh, it's always a joy to be here with you guys just listening to testimony. So a very sweet, dear sisters in Christ and brothers and sisters in Christ. And it is always a joy just to get to know the body of Christ. You know, sometimes people that we go to church with or uh, friends that we've met through social media. And it's just really sweet to uh, for the blessing that it is uh, that social media can be to all of us. And I think we can almost all of us can relate to that. And today we have another special guest. Uh, we have Erin Coates. Uh, she is the wife of uh, Pastor James Coates. Uh, they live in uh, Canada. I know that some of my friends, uh, some of you guys who uh, listen to the podcast probably uh, are aware of who they are. Um, I think uh, within last last year or, so, or from 2020 when COVID happened and all that, and they shut down everything and closing churches and everything. Um, if you have been keeping up with the news or on social media as well, um, you know that uh, her husband, uh, who is a pastor up there in Canada, uh, he was arrested because he decided to, st to stand firm and open his church. They were very faithful. And I think for many of us, they have been such a great encouragement. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, get to know Erin and just to hear her testimony of salvation and everything that the Lord has done and continue to do in her life. And uh, also my hope is that we can hear a little bit of what's happening with them and with her husband and, and her family and the church. Uh, so that is my hope. And I hope that this can be an encouragement to you all. So thank you again, guys. Thank you so much for uh, listening and even sharing with your friends and family. Um, and my hope is that those who do not know Christ, they will come to know Christ through the testimony of salvation of every believer that we bring to this podcast, um, but also that the body of Christ, the church, our friends, believers, uh, they will be encouraged uh, through this testimony. So that is my hope. And I hope that the Lord will use it. Uh, to glorify himself. All right, friends, and here's my conversation with Aaron. All right, friends, so I am here with Aaron. Welcome, Aaron, to our podcast. It's such a joy for me to have you here today. Oh, thank you. The joy is mine. Well, I gave a little introduction, and I think a lot of people have been able to learn a, a little bit about you, uh, you know, in the past year or so, right, about your family. And I've had the opportunity to listen to your testimony and the new podcast that you have with Brooke Bartz. And um, I mean, I, that's what I do. I listen to testimony here, you know, and just amazing uh, just to hear the way that the, wor the Lord works in each and one of our lives. We are all, all coming from a different background, different story, different country, probably. But it is beautiful to see how we all come to that one point that it's we all need Christ. You know, we are sinners in need of a savior. And I think um, because of Christ, now we're part of the same family. And it's uh, just amazing to 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 see, you know, just the wonderful power of the gospel and I'm so encouraged by you and your family, and it is really a joy for me to, to have you today. Oh, thank you. That's an encouragement. So I normally like to start with my guests, uh, just giving us a little background about, about them, you know, all the way from your childhood, your upbringing with your family. So, you know, just remember, take us back to, you know, when, where you grew up and, and if you were raised in a believing home. And I always say, feel free to share as much as you like. <laughs> Yeah. Well, how much time do you have? <laughs> uh, as much as you have. 
Um, well, I was born in Scarborough, Ontario, and actually my husband was born in Scarborough, Ontario as well. Most people think we actually met down at seminary in California, and we did not. Uh, we were actually born in the same city, and the Lord just so orchestrated our life to bring us together. It really is a marvelous story. Um, and so I grew up in just outside of Toronto area, so a huge city that we're living just outside of. Um, and I did grow up in the church. Uh, I grew up in a nominal Christian home where we went to church every Sunday. And that was really about it for our home. We, we did the, you know, I went to youth group in, in Awana and stuff like that. I was, I was a spark. And, uh, uh, but the truth never, ever really hit home to my heart. Um, it was just something that we did as a family, but it wasn't really evident in my home that lives were living for Christ. And when I was about three years old, um, I have a Gumby quality about me. So I don't know if you know who Gumby is. He's like that green, no. like rubber guy. <laughs> <laughs> seventies, I think it was the seventies, okay. but he, he would like bend him in all different directions. So my mom noticed at a small, at a young age, I was very flexible and, uh, and would, would jump off furniture and, and do all of these flips and stuff like that. So she thought, okay, we're going to put her in gymnastics. Uh, so I started gymnastics when I was three years old and, uh, gymnastics really was my life and it's, it's what consumed me. It was my love when I wasn't training, I was watching gymnastics when I wasn't watching it, I was talking about it. Um, so it's really what consumed my heart and my life. And I started competing at around the age of seven and that carried on until I was about 15 years old. And, and so, because that's what consumed my life, I didn't care about anything else. It really was this huge idol in my life. It was what identified me. So when people explained to me, they'd be like the short bubbly gymnast is kind of the <laughs> long curly hair bubbly gymnast is kind of what I got. Um, and so when I quit gymnastics, cause it really started to affect just my pain level, my back, my knees and stuff like that. Um, I, I thought I'm going to win provincials in my age category, and then I'm, I'm done. And uh, so when I quit gymnastics, I didn't really know what to do at that point. And as I was quitting gymnastics, it was, uh, I was stepping into high school and in high school, there's all of these new people outside of the little circle that you go to elementary school and junior high and all of these people who are coming from backgrounds and, and just this life of sin that I had never really been exposed to before. And I, and I really didn't know my identity. Like I wasn't being taught who I am in Christ. And I always say this to parents, you need to teach your children identity in Christ, why they were born, why they're here, what will happen if they don't accept Christ in their life. And so I, I just didn't know what I was doing. And so when I saw all of this sin and, and these people that were seemingly having a great time and having fun and meeting all these new friends, I really just started to fall into a life of sin. I wasn't prepared for it. There was stuff that I was subjected to at a young age that I just didn't know how to handle that kind of stuff. And so really just started a, a, the pursuit of depravity in my life that was giving me the same kind of joy and, and pleasure that gymnastics did. And so I, get, I just started to find my identity in boys and drugs and I uh, really took that to the full extent of um, just a life of depravity. And so the older I got, the worse it got. That carried on for, for years as I finished high school. And then uh, I went into business college and to put myself through business college, I thought, well, I'm going to work at a bar um, to put, so work at night and put myself through school during the day. Well, that opened me up to a life that I had just like so much stuff. And there was still like a relative, I don't, I don't want to say innocence because I had committed so much sin at that point, but the stuff that the, the nightlife brings into your life is on a different scale. Uh, and even in that, the Lord really protected me from what I could have fully been involved in and what it's really organized crime in, in, in some way. So the Lord really did keep me from some of that. Uh, and so I just see that as his protection. And so as I was putting myself through business college and making all of this money, I was making a ton of money. I met uh, a young man at, at the bar and I ended up getting pregnant with my first son and was absolutely terrified because how am I going to tell this Christian family, like, you know, how I'd been living my life essentially. And so I, for the first time had just 
cried out to the Lord to help me. I didn't know what to do. And uh, there was people in my life that were really pressuring me to have an abortion at that point. I was the kind of child who was on the side of the road when I was 11 year old, like picketing against abortion, that abortion was wrong. And so I knew it was wrong and didn't really want to do it. Actually, there was a comment made to me that really was disheartening. Somebody had asked me, they, they looked at me and they're like, so you're telling me you've actually never had an abortion before? And I was like, I've never had an abortion before. <laughs> no, yeah. I haven't. Um, and so I just was, uh, I didn't know what to do. And so went to the abortion clinic, made the appointment. I want to say I, I was probably like three or four months at this point, but not showing at all. And uh, as I was walking down the road, this is, this is my perspective. I don't know what was actually <laughs> happening on the outside, but I was looking down and then I looked up and there was this woman standing in front of me and she just looked at me and she said, you know what, you, you're not going to do this. You're going to turn around. You're going to get in your car and you're going to go home. And I thought, okay, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to go home. <laughs> and, uh, and so she actually walked me back to my car and, and the person I was with was just yelling at her and calling her names and calling me names. And so I got in the car and, and she asked me to undo my window. And so I undid my window and she slipped a little piece of paper through the window, which had like verses on the value of life. And, uh, so I thought, okay, like I am going to have this child. And so I did, it took me uh, still a few months after that to tell my parents that I was having a baby and uh, was absolutely terrified, had my first son, um, really thought I'm going to raise him in the church. And so I went back to the church that I had grown up in. I actually had left the church when I was 18 because there was, okay. I just saw hypocrisy. And I was like, you know what, if, if people are going to live in sin, and then pretend that they are good people on Sunday. I'm just not going to have any part of this. I'm just going to go live a life of sin. And then I don't care if people knew what I was doing. So I just saw a lot of hypocrisy and I left when I was 18. And uh, that was just my reason for leaving. Um, well, how old were you when you had your first son? Uh, 21. So okay. 21 or 22. Pre I was 21 when I got pregnant and then 22 when I had him. Okay. It was 2003. And so I thought I'm going to raise him in the church. Like I want him to make his own decision in regards to following God, totally misguided. Uh, so I went to church with him when he was a baby. And I remember my pastor saying like, they were going to be taking the college and career group to see the passion of the Christ. Never thought anything of it. I just remember him saying that. And then uh, because I was really trying to clean my life up at that point without the gospel and without the spirit, um, I only got so far and then started falling back into my old lifestyle and uh, started dating a friend of mine. And I ended up getting pregnant again. And I thought, I, I can't have another child. I have a career. I have, I'm already a single mom. Um, I can't have another child. And so I had decided in my heart that like this was it. I was, I was not going to follow through with this pregnancy and, uh, made an appointment at an abortion clinic that the, um, Henry Morgenthaler is an abortionist. He's, he's dead now. Um, but he is the one who made the way for abortion in Canada to be decriminalized. So there's no, actually there's no laws against abortion in Canada and you can have an abortion up until the point of, um, birth and even, um, live abortion is a gray area in Canada. And so if you're 12 years old, you can have an abortion. Your parents don't need to know. This is where I went. And, and Henry Morgenthaler was alive at that time. And so I went to this clinic. It was, have you ever seen the movie unplanned? I have not yet, but everything, I, I've heard about it. Happens, yet. Yeah. Everything that happens in that movie is so true and real. Mm -hmm. And, uh, abortion in Canada is free. And so I went and, uh, and I had an abortion and I remember that the moment is so vivid in my thoughts. It's, it's really heartbreaking. Um, and I knew as soon as I did it, that it, like, I had just murdered my child. I had done something I couldn't take back. And I remember they have you in this little gown and you're eating a cracker and they have you in kind of a, a curtained off area where you're sitting to kind of like be ready to leave. And I remember looking at this young girl in front of me who just was so annoyed that she even had to be sitting there. And I thought, oh, wow, this girl, this is not, there was something that just 
like, let me know this was not her first time there. Like this was not a big deal to her. And I was shattered inside. Like I was, yeah. uh, the conviction was so strong. It was so heavy. And I didn't know what to do at that point. Um, and so I ended up falling into a pretty deep depression. Um, I wasn't, I don't think I would have taken my life, but at that point I just didn't, I didn't want to live because I couldn't handle um, the conviction of sin that was in my life. And, uh, and obviously with my oldest son wanting to, I couldn't just leave him. Um, and so I tried to just live the next couple of months surviving. And, uh, and, and so him and I were home one night, he was sleeping and I thought, you know, my cable wasn't hooked up. I'm going to go get a movie. And I, I walked in the movie store and there's this massive display of the passion of the Christ and, and think what you want about the movie. I know there's Catholic overtones and all of this stuff that, um, I just didn't see any of that. I just, from the first scene in the garden realized like everything that I had learned as a child, this was what Christ had done for me. And, and how could I live my life like this? Because the, I could always in my life, look at somebody else and go like, I'm better than them. You know, their sin is way worse than me. They're doing drugs. I would never touch. And so I had this like self-righteous system that even though I was committing really heinous sin, that there was always somebody who was worse than me. And as long as my friends were worse than me, yeah. I was good. Uh, <laughs> but with, with the abortion, I couldn't do that. And, and this was something I knew was wrong. And, you know, I knew this was murder and, uh, and, and so when I watched the movie, that was, that was it for me. I had, I had seen a picture of what Christ had done. I knew the gospel. I confessed my sin. And from that point on, my life was just drastically changed and, uh, but still had to live with, and still do live with the consequences of that. I mean, I would have a, I have a 19 year old now I would have a, an almost 18 year old. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so having to live with the consequences of what I did was, was really difficult for me. And I always tell this story about how, um, I would cry every day from the point that I was saved. I had met James probably about a year and a half, uh, into being saved. So was, we were both really young believers when we met and, uh, just remember crying. And he was the first person I had told about my abortion. And uh, we were sitting in church and the pastor was preaching on how, you know, you just have to forgive yourself. And so I'm sitting in his car after church and I'm crying, going like, I can't forgive myself. And he looks at me and he just so gently says, you know, Aaron, are you above God? And I was like, like, what are you, what do you mean? And he's like, nowhere in scripture are you commanded to forgive yourself, but to embrace the forgiveness that you already have in Christ. Mm -hmm. And then I realized what I was doing that I thought that this sin was just the unforgivable sin, that it was too awful, that Christ could forgive everything else, but not this. And, uh, and then I realized that what was coming out of me was penance that I, I needed to add to the gospel that I needed to cry every day that I needed to feel so badly about this sin because I did feel badly about it and the enemy just had a heyday with that. So once I understood the fullness of the atonement and that Christ forgives me for the most vilest of sin, I was free. And so now the consequences of my abortion are are a sanctifying means in my life, not a, not a condemning means in my life where there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so the Lord uses that to sanctify me because as I grew more, especially in sound theology and, and in what, what the gift of motherhood is, it didn't get easier with what I did, it, but it, I just kept pointing back to the cross now. So no, no, no. Like, even though I'm realizing the depths, even more of what I did and, and the um, beauty of motherhood and the gift of children that I could keep pointing back to Christ. And so that was really, it was the sin that, that saved me. Um, it was a sin that I knew was sin and that I couldn't just be like, well, everybody else is doing it, you know? Um, and that it was so awful. I was able to really just see what I was capable of. And that, that scared me. And, uh, one thing that really, you know, with this whole Louisiana law that mm -hmm. didn't get passed because of pro-lifers, um, I read the letter that was written by, and I think it was the SBC, their ethics department, like even they had signed off in a bunch of pro-life, um, people had signed off on it. And then saying that, you know, we, women are victims of the abortion industry and, and that because of the level of depression and 
suicide that women face because of abortions. Therefore, they are victims of it. And I just thought, this is so wrong. There are there are going to be genuine, you know, especially young women who are pressured to get abortions and they don't understand them, what they're doing. There are going to be a very small number of those, but but the depression and the suicide that they feel after is not because they're a victim of the abortion industry. It's because their conscience has it's been violated. They've sinned against God. And, and so if you take away, if you call women who murder their children victims, how are they supposed to be saved? Right? Mm -hmm. Like they, you need to show them that they are sinners, that they've committed this atrocity. They're not gonna be able to stand before the Lord and say the abortion industry made me do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was really, really sad for me to see that they abolished or just kiboshed that, that law um, and that pro-life, the pro-life movement was a part of that. Um, because I feel like if abortion was criminalized, if, if there was a greater consequence, like I was going to jail <laughs> and, and it wasn't so readily available to me that I would have, I would probably still have my child. Actually, I probably wouldn't have been living the life that I lived. Um, because there was greater consequences to that. Like, I'm not going to go and, and steal something because the consequences are so great. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I, I trained my children that way, that if you sin, like there's consequences for that sin and we discipline you for that sin. Well, that makes my kids think twice about if they're going to engage in that sin. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was really sad to see that whole thing go down and, um, and to really keep the abortion industry going. Yeah. yeah. And it's really sad to see even, you know, like the Lord has established the government is meant to be punished and evil, right? To restrain evil. Um, and yet here we see them just setting people free to indulge in all of their sins and everything that their heart desires, basically, which is evil. Um, and it's just really devastating to see it because it's just becoming more and more evident nowadays, you know, it's like, there is no restriction, restraining anything. It's just more like, go indulge in whatever your heart desires. Yeah. And everything that God hates, basically. Yeah. And something that you were mentioning, uh, which is similar to uh, what I used to think, you know, that you said like, oh, how could God forgive me when I have committed an unforgivable sin? And that happened to me when I was thinking, when I tried to commit suicide, which I did, I, I tried committing suicide when I was 15. And as a Catholic, for me, that was like, oh, that is an unforgivable sin. And no, that it's not true. The Lord is willing to 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 forgive any one who repents, who truly repents and calls out to his name. And, and I think that's, um, uh, you know, just a, this mentality that has been, you know, that, that we have, I don't know, maybe for me, it was because of the Catholic teachings uh, that I grew up with, but no, the Lord is willing to forgive. And it's so beautiful. Like, like he says, right? Like that he washed you, washed you as white as snow, made you white as snow when, you know, when the Lord forgives us and he doesn't remember our sins anymore and that it's just the beauty of the gospel. Um, and it's just, it's just so encouraging to, 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 to know that, that we have a father who is willing to forgive our sins. So I now want to take it back a little bit with your upbringing. Do you remember, because you said that you were raised in a believing home, right? And so you were in church and everything. Uh, do you recall like your parents, you know, just teaching you at home, uh, the gospel, um, how will they confront sin in your life? Did they do that? Um, do you remember any of that being done at home? No. Um, there was a lot of law, but no gospel. And so when we were told not to do things, uh, there was never any biblical basis for that or, or your sin being against God. And now it was later to figure out my parents weren't saved. Like my mom has been saved within the last couple of years. Wow. Praise the Lord. So yeah, I'll don't even stop that. praying for your parents. <laughs> yes. Um, and, uh, so she just didn't know. Right. And, and our church was, was kind of more in the seeker friendly, kind of side of things. And so, yeah, a lot of law, but no gospel, no, no ministering to the heart. Um, I don't remember even discipline as a child, um, that there was really no consequence for the stuff that we were doing as kids. And, and, uh, you know, we were so heavily involved in sports as children that there wasn't a lot of even home life happening. Um, I had, I had, I, 
I love my parents and uh, we had some really great moments and uh, still did. So I don't want to make it sound like it was all bad, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to, yeah, ministering to the heart, they did, not, they just didn't know. They, and yeah. Uh, so, yeah, no, there wasn't, there wasn't a ton of parenting in that, in that area. And how many siblings, like how many siblings do you have? How many are you in your family? Do you have any siblings? Yeah, I have two brothers, one older and one younger. Um, and I'm really the only one who knows the Lord. Well, okay. besides my mom. Yeah. All right. And then your mom now and your dad. And yeah, my mom actually is here. Uh, so my parents are, are divorced and, uh, my mom came here, I think three years ago and ended up getting saved. Wow. And, uh, my dad's still back home and I'm a little bit of a daddy's girl. Like I, I love him. Uh, he doesn't know the Lord. Um, and, but yeah, so it's, okay. it's, it's not, it's not a pleasant situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And that's something that we can be, you know, praying about and just for their salvation and still praying for my mom. Uh, my dad, praise the Lord, the Lord saved him when I was saved back in New York. But yeah, I, I understand. It's just like, you know, it, there is a burden in our hearts, but in the end, you know, we are faithful to share the gospel, but in the end, salvation belongs to the Lord and he's the one who opens the heart. Um, and that that's where our trust lies, right? We trust the Lord that he is sovereign over all things and, and we continue to pray for them, right? Yeah. <laughs> so now tell me a little bit about how you and your husband met. So you guys were new believers. Tell me a little bit about that. How, tell me about the first time you guys met. <laughs> okay. So my, my mother-in-law actually was attending the church that I grew up in. And, uh, she had asked James to go to an alpha course of all things. And so he goes to this alpha course and gets saved and then starts going to the church that I grew up in. And so when I got saved, I went back to that church and, uh, it was, it was a fairly large church. So he sat on one side of the church and I sat on the other and there's two different services. So a lot of times I would go to the early service, he'd go to the late. And, uh, so we never really saw each other until February of Oh five. Actually, he didn't see me. I saw him and, uh, <laughs> he was, he was getting baptized. It, it's funny when he tells the story, um, I just was so tired of the, the young men in the church. Like, where is your zeal for Christ? Where is your love for the Lord? Like he has, he has caused us to be born again unto a living hope, but I don't see any joy in your life. I don't see like a studying of the word. Um, and I was very like emotional at this time, like just whatever I could grab a hold of, I was grabbing a hold of with zero discernment. So a lot of zeal, no knowledge, <laughs> but I see James in his baptism and this man has such a passion. And, and actually what we both think was happening in his baptism was genuine repentance. Like he, mm -hmm. He kind of had a foot in the world and a, and a, and a foot in the church, but like, wasn't really living full tilt for the Lord. And, and I, they want you to get baptized after you take the alpha course, but in his baptism was like a moment for him where he ended up confessing his sin. And, and then after that moment, just lived righteously. So he thinks he was saved before that, but you know, the cost maybe didn't hit him as hard. It's, it's, it'll be interesting to get to heaven and see like what, what was actually happening in that moment. <laughs> so I'm watching this happen and I'm bawling. Cause like we have this similar life. And, um, so I'm looking at him going, Oh man, that is the kind of man I want to marry. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was February. And there was a few times I had kind of seen him around church and, and then to like, say to him, you know, um, Hey, your testimony is really encouraging. And, but every time I would go to like, say something to him, somebody would start talking to him or somebody would start talking to me. And so after a little while, I just didn't think about it anymore. Yeah. And, uh, actually there was a one moment we were at a barbecue and, uh, standing in the church parking lot, I'm in line to get hot dogs. And he walks up right beside me and stops. <laughs> and I'm <laughs> down at his shoes and going, Oh, he has really nice shoes. But I never said anything to him. <laughs> he was wearing Nike shock, nice shoes. <laughs> and, uh, and so I had, I had, uh, my oldest with me at that point. And, and so I was getting him hot dog. And so that it was just a moment in the summer that we still didn't meet. And, uh, there was just things the Lord was doing in his heart and doing in my heart. And it wasn't time for us to meet yet. And, uh, I remember kind of handing over to the Lord, uh, you know, I'm just gonna, if, if you are sovereign, then I believe that you are going to bring the right man into my life. And so I can just serve you 
until you bring him into my life. And two weeks later, I met James. And from that point on, we were pretty inseparable. He, uh, he, uh, I was standing with Isaac in um, the fellowship hall and he, I walk out and, and he says, oh, is that your little brother? And I was like, oh no, that he's my son. And he's like, well, how old are you? <laughs> And he's like, oh, I'm 25 too. So we were, the two of us were actually really dangerous together because we were so excited that the Lord saved us, but we did not have any like sound teaching or discipleship in our life. Um, and thankfully, like my cousin had kind of stepped in and, and was discipling me. And he was actually the first one to go to the master's seminary. James got the call um, feels like he got the call to ministry through a Bill Hybels leadership summit. So it's like, if the Lord can use stuff like that, like MacArthur's entire ministry is against guys like Bill Hybels <laughs> and Rick Warren. And, um, so my cousin had gone to TMS first and had convinced James that, um, from second Timothy two, how he needed to be trained in expository preaching. If he was going to go into ministry. Yeah. Then, then James wanted to go to TMS and he got accepted. He proposed to me, uh, we got married two months later and then seminary and then ministry. We've had a pretty crazy life. Wow. So yeah. do, do you ever feel that, did you ever feel a little fearful because you already had a son and like thinking of like, Oh, you know, I want to be able to get married someday. Did you ever feel fearful that maybe all oh, that was going to make it too complicated or anything like that? Or so you will feel rejected by someone because, you know, if they learned that you had a son or anything like that. No, I think I was so oblivious. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, no. And maybe because, uh, James never made me feel that way. Okay. Like he always just, I, it, I think, Maybe I did. It's hard to remember. Maybe I did. Um, there was definitely mo like shame that I, I had to fight that I, I just had this um, picture of how I had lived my life and it was sinful. And I remember really feeling that way coming to Grace Community Church, because here you have all of these godly people and uh, they never judged me for it. They were, I, I remember reading a comment online. Somebody had commented on one of my testimonies that if Grace Community Church and the Master Seminary had known my testimony, there's no way they would have ever let James in. And I was like, they absolutely knew my testimony. He he met with Ray Merringer, yeah. uh, our entire story. And Ray said to him, there's going to be churches that don't like it. Um, yeah. But but like, no, you're this is this is fine. We're all sinners. Yeah. Um, so they they knew and, and they're so gospel centered and they never, ever made me like feel that was just me in like my yeah. sinfulness, but yeah, there was definitely moments where the consequence of sin, I would feel the weight of that for sure. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about, obviously he thought that your son was your little brother, <laughs> but, um, once he felt interested in everything, like what was that dynamic between him and your son and, and, you know, and him, you know, trying to pursue you though, you have a son, like, what was that like for you guys? Yeah. Um, well, we were, we were pretty guarded over, um, just the relationship and making sure that our relationship was going to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and that Isaac just knew that he was a friend of mine and, uh, but their relationship has definitely grown over the years. Um, they have a wonderful relationship. I love it. I don't, I don't see a difference in how he treats, uh, my children, and, and between Isaac and Caleb, like these are his sons and he loves his sons and he he's, yeah, he's a wonderful father, uh, a wonderful leader. And he really, yeah, he's always treated Isaac like he was his, his own, his own son. Yeah. 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 And we have all been, been adopted by the Lord, right? We are yeah. his children. So yeah, <laughs> that is a beautiful, beautiful picture of a gospel and how we are adopted in Christ. And yeah, we just, we run and function as a normal family and, and home. Often I forget. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's amazing. So mm -hmm. at what point did he decide that he wanted to pursue ministry, that he wanted to be a pastor in at what point does he enroll at the master's uh, seminary? 
So he, uh, the leadership summit, it's funny because we were both at the leadership summit, both like really wanting to be used by the Lord. And I feel maybe that was early 2005. And so he had, he had dedicated his life to wanting to serve the Lord in a leadership capacity. And he started to go to Tyndale uh, seminary in Toronto, which is not a very sound seminary. Um, and so he was taking some systematic theology courses there. And then the following year of 2006, my cousin went to TMS, sat him down and, uh, and James said, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply. And so he went down to the 2007 shepherds conference, talked to all of the people he would have needed to talk to, uh, wrote out an application. And then I think it was like a month or so later, they actually allowed my cousin to call us and tell us like, wow. he's accepted. Wow. And, uh, so in 2007, that was May, 2007, then May 19th, he proposed, we were married July 28th. And then two weeks later, he flew to LA. And then two weeks later, um, Isaac and I flew to LA just it was cheaper flights. So we were just grabbing onto every ministry we could. And we were listening to James McDonald's ministry. And that was really the ministry that got us really excited about the word and the seriousness of, of the sufficiency of scripture. But there was a point because he was very topical in his teaching where we just like we needed something more. Mm -hmm. And so our friend actually, um, his dad was listening to John MacArthur and he was like, you know, you guys really need to listen to this man's teaching. And I remember listening to the doctrines of grace, um, probably would have been early 2006 and, uh, and being like, who is this man who teaches us the Bible? And so we literally listened to every sermon John MacArthur has ever put out and reading all of his books. And so I really started to see James's theology form and, 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 and taking the leadership role in our relationship and, and being serious about the word of God and serious about doctrine and pursuing holiness. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was kind of just the, the call was more clear to him as he did a deep dive into scripture and started learning more and was leading a Bible study and started preaching. And um, so I have just always been amazed at his, his gifting, his love of Christ. And um, yeah, he's my favorite person in the whole wide world. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it was so sweet because I think you uh, posted a picture on, on Instagram when he was a little kid with Pastor John. No, that was Isaac. Wait, what? Wait, that was your what? I thought it was him. <laughs> no, that was that was okay. probably about 2007, I think. 2007, 2008. Oh. Um Isaac was probably about four or five in that picture. Yeah, that's Isaac. Oh, for some reason I just thought it was your husband. Okay, <laughs> I got it wrong. <laughs> Oh, wow. This whole time I've been thinking, oh, that was so cute. I think that's him when he was a kid. And he was, I might have even told my husband that. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I have, I have to fix that now. <laughs> yeah, so um, that uh, if that was 2007, that would have been like 15 years ago. So yeah. Pastor John would have been about 73. He's no. 85 now. I mean, he's 83 or 83, 83. almost 83 in June. 83, 83. I'm not, yeah. not good at math here. So yeah, he would have been like 68 maybe oh, in that God. picture. Wow. Uh, and then James okay. is 42. So okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Never mind. But <laughs> so I that was your son. He's got a little stop sign and he had just come out of the, the kids program. It says you can't stop the gospel. So when I took a picture of them, he puts up this little sign. And I thought this has just been the theme of our life. Um, wow. Such a perfect picture of Pastor John and, and Isaac. And yeah, I can't stop the gospel. I love it. <laughs> That's amazing. So wonderful. So and how long were you guys here in LA then? Like a little less than three years. Uh, so we would have come August, 2007, and then we're there till May, 2010. Okay. So and then, three years. so how do you guys end up, uh, do you know, at this church where you guys are now? Yeah. Our hearts have always been for Canada. Um, I remember even thinking as James is putting his um, application into the master's seminary, thinking like, if I have to let go of this relationship for him to go and be trained, because like Canada just needs men in the pulpit, I'm willing to do that. 
Um, so I remember having to like let go of my like love of him and just being like, okay, like we need sound preachers and I might not be able to get over the border with Isaac. Um, and so if that's the case, he has to go. And, uh, and so our heart has always been for Canada, just looking at what's happening up here. And in 2010, uh, there was a search committee that had come from Grace Life Church. They were, they were then called Grace Reform Baptist. Mm. Um, Grace Reform, yeah, Grace Reform Baptist. And uh, they had come looking for a guy at the Shepherds Conference and they weren't expecting someone from that graduating class because they thought there's no way we're going to we're going to find a guy from this graduating class. And so they went and met with Ray Maringer. He was probably gone by the time you came. He, he was like the TMS administrator. Oh. Was he there? OK, I don't know. So they had sat down with him and, and Ray says, like, I have a guy for you. Um, and his wife had, had discipled me in seminary wives. And we had been burned a little bit for the very situation that you were talking about, um, that someone had known our past and just was like, we want a pastor who is squeaky clean. And, uh, and so we were, we were a little bit hurt by that and a little bit like tentative to, to move forward. And, uh, I remember totally off topic. James went to meet with John and was like, if John tells me I, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. And so he went to go see pastor John and he told pastor John, like what had happened with this church in Canada or potential church in Canada. And, uh, and so he's like, so am I done? And pastor John's like, no, you're not done. He's like, we don't care about your past. I want to know, are you loving your wife now? Are you loving your children now? Are you preaching the word? Are you being faithful? And uh, so he just encouraged him like, no, keep going. Like, like you, the Lord will put you where he wants you. And so that was a huge encouragement. Um, so these guys had come and, and Ray had said, I've got a guy for you, um, but I need to know that if I give you his name, you are going to take care of this family. And uh, so they were like, yeah, okay. And so he shows them James's picture and they walk out of the seminary building and you know, you know, the shepherd's conference, there's, there's 3,500 men scattered everywhere. And James yeah, is, of- <laughs> yeah, he's working the shepherd's conference because he was on facilities. Okay. So he was outside changing the garbages and talking to just some pastors that had come and these guys walk out of the TMS building and they're like, is that James like standing right there? And it was, (laughs) they they walk up to him and they were like, Hey, you know, we're from this church in in Edmonton, Alberta. And, uh, can we meet with you? And James was like, sure. And so he calls me and he tells me about this church that, that wants to talk to him. And so I get online and I'm looking at their website. I'm tearing apart like all of their, their statements and everything. And I call him back and I'm like, honey, this, this little light is shining in Edmonton. And so we were thrilled. And I remember the moment, cause I'm, I'm listening to Dr. Lawson at the 2010 Shepherds conference. He's speaking on Job. Um, ah, oh, what is it, the invisible war? Mm-hmm. And while I'm like scouring this website <laughs> and, uh, that was just such an exciting moment for us. So he went and he had uh, dinner and dessert with them and we were just thrilled. And, uh, so he filled out an application and we waited a little while and then he got the phone call. Yes. We want to bring you and your family up to candidate. And we were kind of thinking like, we didn't know what was going to happen, Uh, We didn't know if this church wanted us. And then James was also looking at doing a THM and coming under the wing of Dr. Murphy, who is just a marvelous man. Um, And so we thought, okay, let's candidate at this church. And if they say no, we're just going to stay in Canada. Because we had some like legal issues that we were dealing with in regards to getting Isaac over the border. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we thought, okay, if this church doesn't want us, we're just going to go home and, and minister with my cousin. And so within a couple of days of being there, they were like, we, we want to bring you guys on. And so that was 2010. And this church, ever since that night of looking at the website has had our heart. They are our greatest love. Uh, that love has not diminished over the 12 years we've been in ministry, but has only increased. And yeah, we just are so privileged and blessed to be ministering at this church. Not that it hasn't had its difficulties and ministry is really hard. You're dealing with your own sinful heart and other people's sinful hearts, but, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have, it has been so wonderful to be at this church. And I think we, from the other side, from here, from America, we've been able to see obviously your love for Christ first and foremost, and then for his church. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I will, I will love if you can just uh, tell, share with us a little bit about, you know, when COVID hits and all of this craziness happened, you know, I mean, we here to deal with our own things and uh, at, our, at our church, lawsuits and all kinds of things. But you guys also had your own trial to go through uh, with your church and your family, I mean, family, you know, everything. So can you just share a little bit about how from the beginning of how that started and what happened to, to your family and the church? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I look at Pastor John's ministry in our life and, and even Dr. Lawson, but, you know, so much of our stand, um, had, had pastor John not been the man that he is and his love for the Lord, his love for his word, his love of holiness, his love for the church. I don't know where we would be today. He has really, um, been such an example to us and even moments going through the trial where I would remember things that he had said, um, and, and helping me get through it as he would, he would, through his preaching, kind of direct me back to the word. Um, but yeah, so it starts with pastor John's ministry and, and his fidelity to the word and his love of, of the church that we got to be a part of. He was my pastor, you know? And, uh, so, so much of our stand, so much of who James is as a preacher and a man, God has used that ministry and has used pastor MacArthur, uh, so much and, and Dr. Lawson as well. Um, so that's where it really started. And then James, even with his doctorate, uh, his, his preaching project for the doctorate was the priority of preaching in the life of a believer. And so he's telling us the significance of, of the, one of the primary doctrines of grace of preaching the word and what that all entailed of being together as a body, it's a corporate act. And, and like what comes out of preaching is fellowship and, and the communion and baptism, all of this, right. Yeah. Um, and so we were really strengthened by his preaching project, which he finished in, in 2019. So that was really another layer on the foundation of, of grace life standing. And so when COVID hit, we, like everybody else, we, we closed down the church because we didn't know what is this. Um, so within like, I think a month, you know, James is pretty in tune with what's happening politically and within the church. And he's, he's a very, not only is he one of my favorite preachers, well, my, he actually is my favorite preacher. <laughs> he's a very intelligent man. Um, and so he's really just watching what's happening. We're, we have frontline workers that we're working with in our church, our, our doctor and nurses, and the stuff that we're hearing from the hospitals is not lining up with what the media is telling us. And so our elders and elders in training really had to wrestle with what, what are we doing? Like, what is the local church? What is the role of the government and all of that? Um, and so we opted to open our doors when the emergency act came, like when it came off, because at one point during the emergency act, you're only allowed to have 10 people at church, no singing, no communion, none of that. Um, and so that was really, that was really difficult and hard on our church. We started to really see the effects of a lack of fellowship within our body and people falling into sin and depression. And, um, and so our guys just really wrestled with like, what is our responsibility as shepherds of Christ's sheep? And, and we don't have permission to keep the doors closed. And so we opened and people just started trickling back and we're so thankful to be back. And, you know, there were some people who were afraid of COVID and other people who weren't. And uh, so we just started doing life as normal. Well, another emergency act hit in November of, of 2020. And with that emergency act started to come the government like pressure on us to follow the regulations, to not gather, not sing. And then, so we had um, our health doctor who kind of leads uh, was leading everything. So she was putting into place laws. We have a democracy. So in a democracy, you have checks and balances built into the government and how they make laws. Well, in an emergency act, this person can make whatever laws they deem fit. And so she was making these laws, uh, that no gathering, you weren't even allowed to have people into your home, right? You're not allowed to have any contact with people. Um, at one point the grocery stores were like, uh, you only allowed a certain amount of, of people in the grocery store. So you're standing outside and your mask freezing, <laughs> just wanting to grocery shop is so bizarre. And wow. like, yeah. And so they really did not like that. We had kept the doors open because we were really proving their narrative wrong. Nobody was catching COVID. Nobody was dying. Um, and, and the people 
like we, we never had cases until well after they, they stole our building from us. So they just kept wanting us to beat us into submission. And they didn't realize that our guys just couldn't, they couldn't, they didn't have permission from the Lord to close the doors. This is not our church. This is Christ's church. Mm-hmm. And so they were being like the RCMP, which is our policing system. And then they brought us to court. And so they just keep trying everything they can to get us to close our doors. And the, the media is pressuring us. They're lying about us. They're telling all of these stories that he's just a white supremacist. And it was just awful. Um, and so finally they arrested him. And uh, the first time they arrested him was like a catch and release. And I think they thought that would scare him. And it really, it, it didn't scare him though. He's feeling the weight of the cost. And I'm, I, this, this is a big long story. So I'm trying to condense it just a little bit yeah, more. Yeah. Um, and so they tried to put him on an undertaking and, but he would not sign the undertaking. The undertaking was that he was to abide by the health regulations, whatever those were. And he just said, I can't sign that. And so the police officers were like, okay, it doesn't matter if you don't sign it, you're still obligated to keep it. And so they were kind of like, we'll see you next week. (laughs) And, uh, so he had broken the undertaking, which at that point is a criminal offense, Mm -hmm. And by having a gathering that Sunday, he was now going to have to face um, the consequences of that. And so although we were disobeying the government, it was not easy for us to do this. We understand that we have to submit to the government, that we are to honor them. And so we take Romans 13 very seriously, contrary to what a lot of people would have you believe about us. Mm -hmm. Um, And so James just said, you know, if I'm taking this stand um, to protect Christ's church and to worship Jesus Christ freely, I have to submit myself to the consequences of that. And so they had called him and said, you know, we, you broke your undertaking. Monday was a holiday. And so they were like, we don't want you to spend the night in the RCMP kind of cage. So, you know, come in on Tuesday and he had turned himself in on Tuesday and that was February the 16th. And he was sure he was coming home. And I was sure he was not coming home because the police officer had kind of alluded to him. He, he had asked me, you know, should my wife drive me in or will I be okay driving my own car? And he's like, no, you should be okay driving your own car. And so he stood in front of a justice of the peace that day. Um, they tried to get him to, you know, sign away the church and he just wouldn't. And so they, he went in front of another justice of the peace and they didn't want to make a martyr of him. So they were like, we're, we're going to release you, but you have to sign these bail conditions that you are going to abide. You're going to restrict the gathering. You're not going to sing. You're not going to do all of these things. And the RCMP brought him in and he's like, you know, you can go, you just have to sign this. And James said, I can't sign that. And the officer was like, it never occurred to him that he wouldn't sign like criminals will sign because they have no conscience, right? They're not going to obey it. They don't care. Um, But we have a man of integrity who's like, I can't sign that because first of all, um, I'm not going to go home and, and leave the church and watch church online. And second of all, I can't sign that because then I'd be signing away the conscience of like over 300 people. I don't have the authority to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they ended up putting him in jail. And from that point, he was in there for 35 days. They tried everything they could to get him to sign. Um, I was trying to bring as much visibility as I could to his jailing and eventually made it on Fox news with Tucker Carlson, which was kind of a breaking point. We think, um, what was probably the catalyst of what got our government moving was the visibility of that, uh, interview. Mm -hmm. Um, and he has written a book. It's called God versus government. And it has all of the details because I'm just flying through this, but it has your story of Grace Community Church written by Nathan Boosnitz, which was so phenomenal because Nathan was one of our elders at Cornerstone when we were at Grace oh, Community you guys Church. Are. Yeah. And his wife was my seminary wives table leader in my third year of seminary. So uh, the Boosnitz family was very dear to us. Uh, so it, it, there was a point too where um, Grace Community Church had made a statement. We stand with James Coates. Mm-hmm. And that just made me cry. Like here, here is essentially the, the church and the man that God has used to form my husband into the man of conviction and man of the word um, that he is. And here they are standing with him. And uh, when I had talked to Mike Riccardi, I just had thanked him. And, and he's like, we couldn't just let him go out in front. And and not like own him, you know, he's from the master seminary. This is the kind of men that we want to produce. 
Uh, so that was just really encouraging for us to see the seminary and the church come behind us and, and love us through that season. Um, and really, you know, people that we thought would stand with us didn't stand. And that was disheartening. But in that, the Lord brought the universal church in just the most amazing way of being able to see her love, uh, her fervency for worship and, and for them to love us through such a difficult time. Like I, I can't even, I don't know everybody who prayed for us and encouraged us, but man, did they really help the Lord use them to help me through that time and to continue to stand and, and to have courage. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I learned about you guys, obviously through social media, through people from my church, uh, that they obviously had met you guys and they were sharing on social media. Then the brothers from Carpe Fide, which I love them and so grateful just to see, you know, the, the way that they've been supporting you guys and standing with you guys. It's been such a blessing. It was such a blessing to meet them at G3 and, and just to see just the Lord, let, you know, the, the Lord providence in so many different ways and how he brings the church probably far away from you guys, but we're part of the same church and how they just, you know, he brings them together, encouraging one another, building each other up, you know, even when probably the people that we expected to, to stand with us, they didn't. Some people left the church, right? Um, and, and that's, we will see those things happening, but we always remain um, faithful to our, our savior because the church belongs to him, not to us, you know? And I think it's been just an encouragement to see, to see that for, for all of us. And a lot of people will say that this is not persecution. Um, why do we consider this to be a persecution? Yeah. Well, first of all, in, in second Timothy three, uh, Paul says that all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Um, and we've always said along the way, like whether this is persecution or not, we'll let the Lord deal with that. Um, but we were taking a stand and now that we know a little bit more about how our government wanted, um, compliance and that when you have someone who's standing that can potentially, um, cause other people to stand up against the government. Now, our reasons were different. Our reasons were for Jesus Christ and him alone. Any kind of freedom fight that was birthed out of that was just tertiary. It wasn't, it wasn't our main concern. Our main concern was Christ and him crucified and his lordship and headship over the church. Um, and so I, you know, when people, the people who were saying, the Christians who were saying this isn't persecution, I actually faced more persecution from them and the things that they would say about James and, and the, the way that they would treat us, I actually faced more persecution from them than I did our government. And that was a really sad thing to see was like all of these people online talking, but not really having all of the details of, of talking and the Lord can deal with them. I, I don't even need to defend myself or, or our, our situation or our stance or anything. Um, the Lord will deal with them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, persecution at its very basic sense is like a mistreatment for your beliefs. And so we believe that the church is Christ alone, that the government does not have authority to dictate the terms of worship. And so when you tell the government, you don't have the, to, the permission to, um, dictate the terms of worship, they're, they're not going to like that because they want control. And actually there was a petition that a reporter had put in well over a year, about a year ago, um, about how often James's name and Grace Life's name had come up in caucus because there was, um, a man in leadership at that time that was out for the churches. And we, we knew that early on, um, that if any churches were to stand, they wanted them closed down. There's 1500 pages of them talking about James and Grace Life Church. And so just knowing the things that they did to James behind the scenes, um, absolutely, it was persecution. Yeah. And, and the fact that our policing system didn't want to be doing what they were doing. And people are always like, well, you know, like, the um, restrictions were across the board and you think, yeah, but who cares? Satan doesn't care about your grocery store and whether it's closed down. He cares about the, the church and her testimony to a dying world. You know, um, he cares about killing the church and, and, and the people within the church. And, and so the fact that people were saying that you're just like, well, first of all, you're just missing the whole like purpose of, of what's happening here. And, uh, 
and you know, with, with monkeypox coming and you're hearing like all of these like restrictions and my husband was just telling me about that. I didn't even know about that, but he was explaining to me what's happening. I was like, what, what, yeah. what now? <laughs> yeah. Well, our government has actually said, you know, we need to take the things that we've learned during COVID and, and lockdowns and apply that to climate change. And so if people think that this is over, it's not over. And so uh, when you stand and you stand for righteousness, you're inevitably going to get hit. Yeah. And um, it, it, it just was really, it was really sad, but it was clear. People didn't know all of the information um, and bless their heart. The Lord will deal with that. Yeah. But uh, I, we didn't even have to care about that. We didn't have to be like, this is persecution. And you know, we will let the Lord deal with all of that stuff. He, he can decide what's persecution or not. My, my obligation to the Lord is to be faithful. I have to be faithful, take a stand for the Lord, Jesus Christ, and, uh, and let him deal with everything else. I'm interested for you to share also, like what's happening. Uh, like, what are you doing while your husband is in jail? Like what are, what, what's happening with the church? What's happening with you and your family while he is in there? Um, he went into jail on the Tuesday right away. You know, you talk about the universal church. Um, the, the men that my husband and I have loved and admired for so long were the men who came and stood by us. And so like, you've got Justin Peters is asking me to do interviews, to bring visibility, Tom Askell, uh, his ministry, Dale Partridge, Chris Huff, like, did I say Josh Bice? I think I did. Yeah. Uh, so like all of these, these men who unapologetically stand for the truth, even Virgil Walker and Daryl Harrison had talked about it on just thinking. And, um, and so all of these men that, you know, have been an example to us came and rallied and wanted to bring visibility. So I spent a lot of my time trying to bring visibility to our situation so that that would put pressure on our government to move. And I did not know how big the universal church was and, and how loud she was going to be. Like we had people in Iran saying like, keep standing people in Germany, keep standing. Yeah. Like, like, you know, the, the persecuted church was from the East was coming out saying, if you don't take a stand now, you will never be able to stand. And so we've got all of these messages coming in from all over the world to keep standing for Christ. And so that was encouraging, but it was those interviews that really helped. Um, there was an interview that I did uh, on the, the Saturday after he was arrested and that had caught millions of views in Canada, was broadcasted on TV on several news stations, um, which really helped people's eyes be open to what was actually happening, that we weren't just these careless people who didn't care about life and death and and, and, and COVID deniers. And so that that was able, that allowed me to tell our story and allowed a lot of people in Canada to see, oh, the, they're not who the media is making them out to be. So mm -hmm. a lot of support came from that and then more interviews. And so I was spending a lot of my time just trying to get him out, um, making different injunctions to try to release him, um, yeah, rallies, everything. Um, and so our church was still meeting after that. Um, I remember the first Sunday telling my children, cause I, I had realized like our story was going out and my name was attached to that and trying to free James. I remember saying to the children, if they arrest me today, I need you to go to your grandparents' house. Um, because we just didn't know, we didn't know what was going to come. Um, and so when we went to church that first Sunday, the streets were lined with cops, like RCMP peace officers, you, it was just lined. And so when we got there, there was all of these people and huge amounts of police officers, but they never tried to get into the church. They said, we were just there to make sure that you guys are okay. And so for the five weeks that James was in jail, they never sought entrance into our building. Like they came and they checked on us, but they didn't try to get in. Mm -hmm. And then the, so we kept worshiping as usual. Wow. <laughs> and that was such a sweet time because there was really, there was a cost and people started realizing we're open, we're not dying. And so people were getting saved. People are coming to the church. Like it was just such an amazing time. But at the same time, like like I wish James could see this because we didn't, 
we're not thinking about an imprisonment having this kind of effect on people. Like our, our people are being like, they're putting off sin. They're, they're wanting to like, they're like, what is life? (laughs) You know, like it it could be gone in a second and, and yeah, out preaching the gospel. Like we have one guy, I don't, I don't know if you know, Devin Davis, uh, who kind of became like our, um, mouthpiece. And, and so he would go to these, uh, rallies and, um, well, everyone is all about their freedom, freedom, freedom. He's sharing the gospel with everybody. And I just loved it. It was amazing. So here we have like people on the ground sharing the gospel. Like we're not about just freedom from the government. We're about freedom in Christ. Cause what is freedom from the government? If you don't have freedom in Christ. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so we life as usual, um, my children, there was definitely moments, um, like it, it was hard for that. It was dark. Um, a lot of, you know, in and amongst all of the encouragement was still the enemy striking and the, the stuff that would be said to us was really hard. It just was dark. I remember waking up sometimes in the night, not being like, I'm having a panic attack in my sleep. And so I'm waking up and I'm crying and can't breathe. I don't know what they're doing to him in there. Mm -hmm. He's keeping a lot from me because our conversations are recorded and I'm having to keep a lot from him on what's happening on a, on a, like inner workings of the government and the police and all of that. Uh, so that was, that was really hard. Um, and then as soon as he was out, they again tried to get in and to intimidate him. And, uh, and so we would not allow them in. We actually have video footage of our elders and deacons, like telling the police, no, you cannot come in. You're breaking the criminal code. And so they couldn't get in at that point. Cause our guys had stonewalled them. And then that Wednesday they stole our building. And that was, uh, just the end of, it was beginning of April. So they, they triple fenced our building. They had like cops everywhere, like, um, riot squad cops from all over Alberta. Like they just made this huge unnecessary scene. Like we're a church and we've shown that we're, we're peaceful. And not only are we peaceful, but, uh, we, we support the government. We just don't support the government and what they're doing here. Um, And so they made this big, huge scene, which then caused more people to stand up. Like everything they did just backfired. Um, So they had taken our building, triple fenced it, had security and police around it 24 seven until July 1st. And then the COVID seemingly kind of disappeared at that time. Yeah, (laughs) They gave us our building back, but then they tried to call another emergency act when we were at G3 actually of last year. Oh, wow. And so James uh, seeks to have an appointment with our premier. And so the premier, I guess, wasn't willing to talk to him and had punted it to the chief of staff of the health person. And so James is meeting with him. They were like, this is great. You know, we can work something out here. And James is like, no, no, no. He's like, I just need to know, are you guys going to do are we going to go through this again? Because it didn't go well for you last time. It went exponentially well for the kingdom, <laughs> but you can take our homes. You can take our children. You can take our church building. We're not going to stop gathering. And so they were like, okay, well, we'll get back to you. And they never got back to us and they never, there was no media. So this is how, you know, the media is connected to the government. There was no media. There was no attention on us. They were trying to keep Um, the fact that we were gathering like under wraps. And so when the premier would talk, he would talk like we, it was something we previously did, but we're not still meeting. And um, so, yeah, they just, they, they didn't want to touch us at that point. And we were really thankful for that because we got to meet in our own building without a lot of difficulty and trouble. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and you guys, so you guys previously had like 300 people in your church. About 350. Yeah. 350. And now you, you, you were telling me that it has grown as well. Like it grew. Yeah, so we've much. more than doubled in, in size. And, uh, some of those are from churches around that just, you know, weren't preaching the truth. Like I, it, it's, it's inevitable that I have a woman standing in front of me every week crying, saying, I, I didn't know I wasn't being fed. I didn't know this about God's word. I didn't know this about my life. Um, And so they're just so hungry and they're like sponges and it's so amazing to see. And then there's people getting saved Mm -hmm. and people who maybe thought they were saved or people just saved out of what, what had happened. Um, So yeah, it's, it's been incredible to see what the Lord has done. Wow. That's amazing. And just to see, right. And I think we've seen it in the, in the Bible too. Persecution just made the church grow even more. Yeah. Um, Which is hard in and of itself. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. <laughs> yes, yes. But just to see also you guys' faithfulness and the Lord's faithfulness uh, to you guys. So it's amazing. It's amazing to see what he's doing and he what he will continue to do with you guys up there. So, and we hope to have you guys down here I soon know. to visit us. <laughs> down here. Yes. Time to open the border. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's about time, honestly. It's about time. Mm-hmm. All right. So now I'm going to transition to my signature questions for the podcast. So do you have any favorite books or a- any books that have been ha- uh, helpful for you? Oh, wow. I'm a huge reader. Usually my favorite book is whatever book I'm reading at the time, but I would be at a, I would be a terrible wife if I didn't say my husband's book, God versus government, uh, when taking a biblical stand when, um, Christ and compliance collide. So, uh, I loved that book. And, and one of the things that I really loved about it, as James told our story was you see, like everyone sees him as this big hero, you know, like he's so courageous, but in, the, and he is, but that, that courage doesn't come without the spiritual struggle, the difficulty, the putting sin to death, the, you know, dealing with your weakness. So that was something that I just really loved about the book was it brought out, um, his struggle to obey, you know, like it just went like, yeah, we're going to obey and I'm good and I'm strong and I'm courageous. Like it came with a lot of counting the cost and, um, having to leave his family behind and, and, and just the pressure, the darkness that he would even face in prison. Um, yeah. So you, you just see a lot of his heart come out in that, and that, you know, if anyone can stand that, that you have to be rooted in God's word. And that doesn't mean there's not going to be fear and trepidation and, um, all of that. So I just appreciated that about it, but, oh man, there's two give me a category <laughs> <laughs> whichever comes to mind like when you what, what books come to mind like you know when you think of us a book that has been helpful and and that you loved it, yeah. that has helped you even you're in your own spiritual walk with the lord so yeah. my most favorite book in the whole wide world would probably be he will reign forever by dr michael Vlock. Okay. And that is on the kingdom passages in scripture. He was, he was, um, a prof- one of James's professors at TMS and his expertise is in eschatology. And so he really just traces the Abrahamic covenant from Genesis to revelation and the fulfillment of the covenant passages. Uh, and he's a brilliant man. So that would probably be one of my most favorite books. And then, uh, I'd have to say JC Ryle's expository thoughts on the gospels. Mm-hmm. Love that. Um, and then, uh, a chance to die by Elizabeth Elliot about Amy Carmichael. I remember reading that really probably within the first couple of months we were in ministry and, and seeing her devotion to Christ and her pursuit of holiness really impacted me to, you know, this life of ministry and, and being in the body of Christ is, a uh, is sacrifice and that I have to give my all to the Lord because these are the people that he loves and that because he loves them, I need to love them. And so she really just affected me in, in regards to the cost of serving Christ and, and doing that tirelessly and with joy. And now three things that bring you joy. Oh <laughs> yeah. <why> three. <laughs> I know. Right. I had to narrow it down for people. And that's like the same expression. I get three, only three. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd have to put number one, my family, like, um, I so enjoy my husband. We, we recently went away just the two of us and I just didn't want that time to end. Like not only are, are we partners in ministry, Um, I just really enjoy him. He's funny. Um, he's caring, he's loving, he's sacrificial. So I just, I thoroughly enjoy him as a person. Um, and then of course our children and, um, I, I love our women's ministry. That is like one of my dearest and greatest loves, um, is, is our women's ministry and being able to write content and be able to minister to them. Um, and then number three, let's put something that's like, so I don't sound so, <laughs> <laughs> so spiritual. <laughs> I'm just what, kidding. What People do say. I love? <laughs> you know, I love connecting with all of, um, like Christ's people on Instagram and being able to talk to them and, and hear their stories. And 
So they're just men and women that I just thoroughly enjoy. Um, but if you want like subcategories to my three favorite, I love bacon. Oh, nice. <laughs> Are you I good food. at it? I, just, I love food. No, not baking, not baking bacon, oh. like pork. Oh, oh, bake. oh, I thought you meant like baking, like, oh. I'm like not good are- at baking. Oh, me neither. That's why I'm like, I, I'm like, I am not good at it. I can cook, but yeah. I cannot be. Yeah, yeah I, I love bacon. Cooking. Okay, I love bacon. Yes, a good bacon. Yes. Yeah, so I, I love food. <laughs> Me That's too. My, one of my joys. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have two more questions. Um, uh, at the end of your life, what do you want to be remembered by? Um, I, I don't want people to remember me. I want them to see Christ. I want them, if if anything, I want to be remembered for someone who always pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and help them to see him more clearly. Um, I'm going to die and be forgotten. So if at the end of their life through the gifting of the spirit that he's given me, if they can say, I love Christ more, that's what I would, that's the only thing I want. That's the only thing that matters. Right. Um, so yeah, I would say that faithfulness. I want to be faithful. Yeah. And why do we need Jesus Christ? <laughs> why do we not need Jesus Christ? <laughs> right? Why do we need? I mean, we always talk about Jesus, 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 right? And I mean, believers, we understand that that we need him even to get out of our bed. Like we need Christ for everything, right? But for believers as a reminder, but even for unbelievers, why is it that we talk so much about Jesus, that we love Christ and we need him? Yeah. Well, it's hard to talk about Jesus without talking about the totality of the the triune God that we serve. Um, But we need Christ to show us the father, you know, Jesus Christ was, was um, it was through him that the world was created. And we as human beings are created in the image of God and meant to worship him and love him and know him. That's our greatest boast. Um, and so without Christ, you, you, he's the image of the invisible God without him, you cannot know the father and without the spirit revealing the son, um, you can't, you can't know God. And so we need Jesus Christ because of the fall of man, because Eve ate that fruit of the tree and Adam willingly did too. We are all now born in the line of Adam. And so we need the Lord Jesus Christ to leave eternal glory, to become a man, to be born up under the law, to keep the law perfectly so that we can then have his perfect life accredited to us. Uh, We need his substitutionary atonement. We need his death on the cross. We need him to face the wrath of God for our sins so that we're able to stand before the father cleansed. Um, He's our mediator. He's our prophet. He's our priest. He's our king. Um, we need his resurrection so that we can be resurrected. Um, we need him for fellowship with the father. I mean, I could keep going we, we need <laughs> him for, for an eternity in heaven. Um, yeah, we, his imputed righteousness, his, his, uh, mediatorial work on our behalf. Um, but everything comes back to the gospel. And so the father has just ordained that the son be who is the the centerpiece so that the glory goes to the son and then ultimately to the father. And it's such a beautiful uh, work of the triune God that, that he does. The spirit's role is to exalt the son and the son is to glorify the father. Um, And so without Christ, you have nothing. You, you don't have atonement for sin. Uh, he, he is, he is holding all things together by the word of his power. Uh, so you don't have Christ. You don't have, you have nothing. You, there's no creation. There's, there's nothing. Um, and so he really is the, the pinnacle of, of, for us to live is Christ. He's everything. He's all that matters. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for uh, joining me. It's been such a joy to get to know you more and just to hear, uh, what the Lord has done in your life. Um, I know that a lot of people, whenever they hear my podcast and they hear this uh, part that comes from a verse, right? That that we have brought, that the Lord brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. They always think, oh yes, your podcast. <laughs> they always connect it to that because that's like what we always say. Uh, the Lord did. He brought it out of darkness into his mar- marvelous light and it's amazing to see how he has done that in your life. 
And I can wait to see what he's going to continue to do with your church and your family. And, you know, our prayers that the Lord will continue to um, giving you guys strength. I know that we need to be praying even more for you guys, because the more the church grows, the more responsibility comes with it. And yes, it is our, our prayer that the Lord will continue to sustain you guys and providing for you guys and protect you and that you continue to be faithful as you guys have been faithful to him and I will be also in making sure that I include the book, the, the your husband's book here on uh, on the description. So it will have a direct link to it and also to your social media. I know it's been very encouraging so they can find you. And um, and yes, so thank you so much. And will you just, uh, will, will you mind closing us in prayer? Not at all. Yeah. Father, we just thank you that your son is so glorious and without him we truly have nothing and so lord as we've just kind of tracked over my life um my life is really nothing it is the exaltation of jesus christ and all of the work that he has done and in, in saving us and redeeming us and sanctifying us and and future resurrecting and glorifying us and so we just pray that anyone who hears this podcast that they would be given eyes to see and ears to hear about the glories of Jesus Christ, because those who reject him will face eternal damnation. Those who do not turn from their sin and put their full faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work upon the cross and his resurrection, um, they will meet you in judgment. And so we just pray that this would go forth with um, power and conviction, even those women who are struggling with the repercussions and consequences of having an abortion, that they would see the seriousness of their sin, that they would call it what it is, not dumbing it down, not being a victim, but really um, saying that this is something that they have done. They have murdered their child and that that is sin, a great sin against you, but you are not unwilling to forgive those who genuinely come to you in repentant faith. And so we just pray that um, you would use this story, but mostly faith comes through hearing, hearing by the word of Christ and that they would hear the word of Christ in the gospel and would turn to you in faith. And we just pray that it would be a blessing and encouragement to your people. Um, what a joy to hear all of the ways that your spirit is working in and through your people from redemption and, and through their life to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and ultimately to the glory of God the Father. And so we're so thankful for that. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of that. Um, I pray for this podcast that it would be a podcast podcast and a beacon of faithfulness, um, of standing upon the truth and the word of God, and that you would use it mightily for your kingdom and glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.